We are starting now our summer 2020 faculty seminar series with uh, three of the outstanding professors of the Shack Institute of Real Estate, Wendy Berger, Alan DeShula, and Phil Neuer. Each have uh, practiced uh, commercial real estate uh, lease negotiations in their own right, but they've also been um, faculty members of SPS for a number of years. I'm going to have each one of them introduce themselves and then we're going to get started in an exciting discussion about the coronavirus and lease negotiations moving forward. So let's start with Alan. Alan, would you introduce yourself, please, to uh, people that are tuning in to us today? Yes, I'm Alan DiCiolo. I'm retired from um, Sherman Sterling, where I was director of global real estate for that firm. Uh, I've been teaching at NYU. I'm coming into my 30th year as an adjunct professor, and I've taught courses um, in graduate and undergraduate commercial leasing, real estate law, negotiation, and land use. I'm also the co-author of a treatise that we've used in our commercial leasing course called Negotiating and Drafting Commercial Leases. Um, been very active in the American Bar Association, executive member of council planning uh, on the real property section, member of the executive committee and uh, active in their senior leaders uh, division. Philip, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I actually paid full price for a copy of Alan's book. <laughs> it's still on my shelf. Uh, it's an excellent treatise and I recommend it to people who are involved in leasing. I've been an adjunct at uh, NYU at the Shack Institute for 15 years. I'm a newcomer compared to Alan. Uh, however, I've been practicing law for over 40 years, concentrating on commercial real estate, business transactions, uh, and the like. Uh, on behalf of all of my fellow attorney panelists today, everything that we say is without prejudice. You can never quote us. Uh, because on some occasions we represent the landlords, on other occasions we represent the tenants, and we're all cognizant of Rule of Professional Conduct 1.7 with respect to taking different positions. We're allowed to do that. Thank you for inviting me along, Brian. It's and great I to have you, uh, Phil. And how long have you been teaching at NYU, Phil? About 15 years. Okay. And Wendy, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your practice, and then also how long you've been teaching at NYU. Sure. Um, I'm a member of the firm of Cole Schatz. I've been at Cole Schatz for over 32, 31 years. I've been a real estate attorney for 40, over 40 years. Um, I practice in all fields of real estate, primarily in development work um, and a lot of representing a lot of restaurants, liquor licenses, due diligence and other acquisition work on real estate redevelopments um, are a big part of my practice as well. Um, I have been actively involved with the commercial real estate women uh, nationally and our New York chapter and the Bar Association. And I've been teaching at Shack for, I believe, three years um, and at another institution, another um, university before that. Um, that a little bit about me. I'm the newcomer compared to these guys. Well, before uh, joining academia and, and becoming the head of the undergraduate division at Shack, I worked for 21 years at the Hearst Corporation, did a number of real estate transactions uh, with them all around the world, uh, was responsible for building uh, the Hearst Tower on 57th and 8th, and then became the head of facilities and the rebuilding of, of Rockefeller Center uh, headquarters for NBC. Um, for a number of years working on lease transactions uh, for them. So we have a stellar panel here to discuss what is really a perplexing issue uh, right now as we face uh, the coronavirus. Uh, New York City uh, has opened, uh, I believe they're on phase four, but with limited occupation. Some of our top real estate uh, developers and uh, landlords have opened office buildings, but things are progressing slowly. Uh, in the interim, a number of firms uh, have been out of the office, and that's presented some legal problems. Alan, why don't we start with you? What are some of the terms um, that people should be familiar with 
um, related to what they should be looking at uh, in terms of office leasing and rent. And we're, we're going to discuss specifically commercial leasing today. At the end, we'll discuss uh, a little bit about the uh, Corona uh, Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, better known as the CARES Act, and what it means for uh, residential tenants. But we're primarily going to be talking about commercial tenants and real estate today. Alan? All right. Thank you, Brian. This is very much a work in progress, and we're seeing some rarely use theories to try to address uh, parties' concerns with, under the circumstances here with the COVID and with the ultimate um, remedy of either rent abatement or possible termination of commercial leases. So we're seeing you know, the, the advent or the resurrection, if you want to say, of common law theories of frustration of purpose, uh, impossibility, impracticability, and the rarely used one for quiet enjoyment under these circumstances. But in each of these cases that we're seeing, uh, most recently, uh, Simpson and Thatcher filing suit against its landlord, uh, just being published a day or so ago uh, here in New York, the theory of force majeure is really the one that's prevalent. And the force majeure really goes to the fact at first, the contract has to have such a clause, um, and it's defined for specific events for which relief is being sought. That'd be the trigger. So such as war, pandemic, fire, flood, etc., cetera, with the remedies being sought under all circumstances, whether there be a rent abatement or an actual termination of the lease. Typically, leases need to have a rent abatement clause in there in order to be operational. But under some circumstances, the restatement of contract section 462 will allow a remedy for rent abatement where there's a temporary impossible situation apl being applied. However, as a practitioner, I never wanna go into a case to argue a rent abatement based on a theory under the restatement of contracts if the lease did not have it in there. So I'm going to stop you there, Alan. Let's let's talk about the Simpson Thatcher case. It's an eight million dollar lawsuit where they argued they were there because of the coronavirus. They're not able to occupy their office at 425 Lexington. It's a good example that you raise. But does the closure caused by COVID-19 meet the requirement that you're talking about? Um, the the force the application of force majeure. It's Questionable. First of all, it depends on how the court is going to look at the clause itself. So first, you're looking at a very narrow application. There have been cases on that already um, with the um, uh, several cases where um, the Whole Foods case, it's a very broad application. Uh, of that, that was decided 2019. That, that, um, that, that dealt with pest infestation. It dealt with We're rodent infestation. Usually, force majeure is used huge. for fire or, or some other huge uh, happening that might happen due to a public emergency. Phil, do you think Correct. that COVID rises to the level of public emergency? And uh, we're just using the Simpson Thatcher case as an example, but that other um, firms will be able to, to use this as a way to get out of paying their rent? I don't Parties like you, are raising this. I, I don't think um, you can get out of the way of paying rent because it's a legitimate position that people will take when they can't use the property. I also, I also want to make it very clear to everyone that the first step in all of these analyses is to read the document because the force majeure clauses are different. They cover different things. And if you're going to rely upon it, you need to know the scope of that force majeure clause. The same thing with quiet enjoyment. Sometimes the quiet enjoyment clause starts with the phrase, so long as the tenant is paying the rent, then the tenant will have quiet enjoyment. So mm -hmm. and as, as mundane as it may seem, you have to go back to the lease document. So e each case has to be individually evaluated based on the language that's uh, negotiated uh, in the lease itself. Th that it brings up an interesting uh, point. Uh, Phil, you represent a lot of uh, tenants, 
uh, as well as landlords. But let's let's take it from the tenant perspective right now. Um, yes, you should be paying rent. That's the first thing you you should know. You can't just stop paying rent, right? But what other things would you advise them in terms of dealing with their landlord now, uh, because they haven't occupied their space um, due to the pandemic for several months? I have a number of restaurant clients who I have one who's been able to operate outdoors, and they've been able to pay some rent. I have another who's been shut down completely. They haven't had any income, and the, the PPP money went very quickly, and now they're at a point where there's no income, and they have to deal with the landlord. And it's really a function of communication and negotiation. Uh, if you wait until you've accumulated a $200,000 rent obligation, as a tenant, that's not the time to start negotiating. You've already let the, 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 the horse out of the barn. You should start, you should have started back in March and April and, and reached some type of an accommodation, whether it's suspend a portion of the rent until the beginning of 2021, whether it's abate some of the rent until 2021. Uh, there are a lot of different methods that we've used in an effort to be reasonable to both sides of this equation. Everybody's suffering. The tenants are suffering, the landlord is suffering. Who's gonna suffer more? Yeah, so and Wendy. Take into consideration the fact that the courts are pretty much closed. Well, so, where are your remedies? Yeah, Wendy, Phil raises the issue of, um, of restaurants. Uh, I'd like to discuss retail with you as well. Um, you know, there's the issue of Victoria's Secret saying, this pause New York executive order that Governor Cuomo has put in effect has basically kept um, a number of tourists out of New York City, uh, away from shopping along Madison Avenue or Sixth Avenue or Fifth Avenue. A particular case in point is the Herald Square property, um, centrally located, that Victoria's Secrets is arguing they can no longer uh, go on with business as usual. What's your take on that? Well, I think it's a very inventive argument because it's a lot of creative writing that Elise was based upon the fact of tourists coming to New York and the number of foot traffic in the area. So clearly that might be the reason that Victoria's Secret signed the lease because of the tourists. But I don't think you're going to find a lease that says, well, this rent is based upon the number of tourists passing by the door of the store every day or the number of tourists walking in. So I think that fundamentally, some of the information they bring in their complaint really has nothing to do with the foundation of the lease and the terms of the lease. Alan, they did not go with the force, force majeure argument. They argued that the governor's executive order was a frustration of purpose and that, um, they're, that it's impossible for them to perform as a tenant in terms of selling their wares under these conditions. Uh, does that prevent them from paying rent? I don't know. I can't say how it's being handled right now because this is a case uh, in progress now, but we might be able to get some guidance from two cases from Illinois. Um, one is in Ray Hintz Restaurant Group. It's a very well-known case within the leasing industry. This is a bankruptcy case decided um, earlier in, in June, just uh, a month or so ago, last month. And there the bankruptcy court partially excused the restaurant from having to pay rent in full. Actually, they excused them from paying 75% of the rent because of Illinois Executive Order 2020-7, which restricted the restaurant's ability to fully operate due to the virus. So here the court found the order created a force majeure event under the lease and excuse the tenant from having to pay that, that amount. The second, and we're talking about Simpson Thatcher here in New York, the second one where I think we might get uh, some additional guidance. Uh, Jenner and Block, prominent law firm in Chicago, um, was sued by its landlord uh, for not paying rent and Jenner and Block countered with among other things saying that its force majeure clause explicitly covered all events 
in current, including the current pandemic. This is one, to Phil's point, look at your lease and see how broad your clause is because you cannot rely on a very strictly construed force majeure clause that'll look at the usual things of labor, um, possibly acts of God, things along that lines, where it's not specifically defined as pandemic. But the, the kicker in the Jenner um, answer is that they had explicitly negotiated for renovation for any event. And they actually have an affidavit from the chief negotiator for the landlord which stated or agreed with that theory. So here Jenner and Block had not only what they claim is lease language that is very broad as we're talking about with the Whole Foods case, but an affidavit from the negotiator on the other side. So again, to Phil's point, read the document and as you're negotiating, take good notes because you never know what the next event is gonna be that's gonna trigger a possible renovation event or force majeure event. So Phil, if, if not the force majeure clause, what other kind of contractual remedies um, are available? You said contractual, there are common law remedies. I, I'm gonna go back to the frustration of purpose. You won't see it in any leases. Uh, you, and getting back to what Wendy said, you're not gonna see in a lease that we're signing it because we expect X thousands of people to walk by our our release premises. Frustration of purpose is not an affirmative claim. It is an affirmative defense. So the landlord theoretically has to take the first move, although you could file a lawsuit that says, I don't have to pay the rent because the purpose of the lease, the very purpose that we entered into this agreement has been frustrated by these events. And whether right. you want to, and, and, if you don't have a force majeure clause and you'd be amazed at the number of leases that simply don't have it, some people just don't speak French. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, you advise clients all the time that are revising their lease now. Um, but what's happening in some of the retail clients that uh, the larger chains, right? I, retail was uh, really in, in trouble to begin with, but now the COVID has kind of accelerated things. And you see um, malls, right, that are losing anchor tenants right and left. And their leases specifically dictate um, um, some clauses that they're attached to those anchor tenants that are leaving. What, what, what should they do, the smaller uh, tenants in those malls? So there are many, you have to look, as Phil has been saying, at each of the leases because there are co-tenancy requirements and those co-tenancy requirements may provide smaller tenant with the avenues in which to break their lease or to have an abatement of the rent or to cut down their rent if the anchor tenant is closed or other tenants are closed in the mall. So that's it. So you have to look each at each um, situation separately. But I think what we have to realize here is there's not one answer for any of this. And those landlords and those tenants who are gonna be successful are the ones that step up and talk to each other. Don't just send a blanket, a blanket letter that some of the retailers have done or some of the landlords have done, but we're finding the ones that will talk to each other and negotiate with each other separately are the ones that are being successful and the ones who are being realistic. Believe me, everyone has been hurt by the pandemic, whether your landlord or tenant or the lender and there has to be a way to find out how to mutually work together. And we're finding that in those circumstances, if you come up with something that's mutually respectful of each, then their landlord is willing to work with you. Yeah, a good example uh, is a cell phone store uh, that uh, I was speaking to, who uh, actually the owner owned several franchises for this uh, store. And he was in too much space, um, wanted to get out. And um, the suggestion that was accepted by the landlord is to take smaller spaces, but renegotiate the lease to a longer term and then pay off the, the, the remaining rent that they put off till later in the term. Was that a good way to resolve an argument, Phil? Or what, what kind of suggestions would you offer? Sure, and I just wanna go back to one thing that Wendy said, uh, well, 
her analysis of the conversation that should be had is spot on. But the, just because you have a potential remedy doesn't mean you're going to take it. I have a, a restaurant client who can't break the lease because the location is associated with that tenant. They have a tremendous amount of goodwill built in. So the concept of being able to break the lease really wouldn't work in that setting. But there are a number of others, as Wendy pointed out, where it would work just fine. Uh, Bill, well, I know you uh, frequent as well as represent a number of uh, high-end restaurants, um, but you know, paying rent at the numbers that they've originally negotiated at, where they are not able to fill up uh, the the room uh, due to this virus, is a tricky thing. A number of uh, restaurants have already folded, but uh, what what kind of suggestions do you have for them, and and what do you think will happen? Again, case by case basis, and the statistic that I heard is that 40% of the restaurants in New York City will never reopen. Uh, if, you, if you have the ability to do some business, whether it's outdoor seating or takeout and delivery, then there's cash flow. And a certain amount of cash flow should be paid to the landlord to at least allow the landlord to have some cash flow, even if it's not the full rent reserved under the lease. What I've been doing with a few of my restaurant clients is paying a percentage of the income. What that means, tenants, is you have to open your books and records and let the landlord inspect so that they can see exactly how much uh, business you're doing. However, that's a cooperative uh, agreement as between landlord and tenant. You won't find it in the lease document itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, I think that's a good segue. Uh, to discuss a little bit about the CARES Act, which has allowed um, the government stepping in and saying you can't evict someone um, um, due to non-payment of rent. Um, Alan, do you want to touch upon that a little bit? Well, the act, we're looking at the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, is enacted on March 27th and includes moratorium provisions protecting rights of borrowers and tenants to stay in their dwelling and so essentially going to residential without facing immediate threat of foreclosure or eviction. Um, I just read yesterday uh, American Bar Association government affairs report that said between 25 and 35 million people will be affected, potentially affected, by eviction notices once the benefits of the CARES Act expire. So we could be in for a very rough fall here as evictions can be filed or evictions that were filed before the CARES Act went into effect and were placed into a moratorium now can, uh, be, can go forward. Three sections in the act, just to go very quickly. Section 4022 places a moratorium on residential foreclosures for borrowers who have a federally backed mortgage loan. So that kind of li would limit the class, although that's a pretty extensive class to start out with. But all borrowers have to do is affirm that they're experiencing COVID-19 related hardship and can request forbearance, not exemption from the loan service for up to 180 days, which also can be extended for another 180 day period. But it, 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 you know, it sunsets at some point. And um, section 4023 looks at borrowers with federally backed multifamily mortgage loans can request a forbearance for 30 days with two 30 day extensions. A tenant with a, residing in a dwelling unit within that property cannot be evicted for non-payment of rent or charged with late fees during the forbearance. Now, the problem is this creates a snowball effect. Landlords are not getting the rents. It's not a, an exemption. Landlords are faced with having to pay uh, their lenders. Lenders are then are, have issues with their investors. So it, 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 it doesn't stop with this. This is only a, a, a moratorium, not a, um, an exemption. And then the third one, section 4024, prevents eviction, provides pre uh, eviction prevention for residential tenants who occupy what's called a covered property, which is defined in any property that's uh, defined with elsewhere in the Act or rural housing voucher program. 
So the landlord cannot evict the tenant without 30 days notice, but it doesn't affect uh, eviction proceedings already filed. So it provides some temporary relief, but I think as we get into the fall, and unless this act is extended um, under the, the acts uh, bill being discussed in, in Congress, we could see a tremendous amount of eviction activities and bankruptcies as well. Our own Dean, uh, Dean Sam Shandon, has an article in Fortune magazine this week written with uh, Peter Mattingly about the economic impact that this could cause if Congress doesn't act soon. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how this can spiral out of control. Uh, Wendy, have you been back to the office or you've been working mostly remotely? Have you, uh, do you have any concern or your fellow attorneys for um, your clients and, and, and how they're um, uh, reoccupying the offices and what does it mean for the economy moving forward? Well, surely we all do because, you know, we all want to get back to business, but everyone wants to get back to business safely. And that's of everyone's first concern because no one wants a second wave and no one wants more concern. Frankly, I've been back to my office usually once or twice a week. Otherwise, we're all working remotely and we're able to do so. Um, what is of concern with people is if their offices are in very tight spaces like New York, where mass transit is the mo method of people going to work, how can you do that safely? How do we look out for the employees? So those are concerns and- um, Yeah, and um, as Wendy talks about going back and making sure that things are safe, this has some landlord tenant um, issues that could arise later on in terms of costs, right, Phil? In terms of operating expenses, in terms of uh, who's, who bears the cost of making sure the testing is done, that the elevator, uh, is working properly, that uh, there's additional security in the building. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Let's go back to the lease. What does it say about operating expenses? Does it have things like security? Does it have things like HVAC? Are you gonna to have to put MERS filters into the air conditioning units so that you filter out 60, 70% of any potential virus that might be in the air conditioning systems? How are you going to deal with the ability of people to use the elevators? We have that at Shack. We, it's in a 10 story building and we occupy three floors. Uh, how are we going to deal with that? Uh, I know my class for the fall is being taught remotely. Uh, the yeah. other thing uh, I want to point out- Buyer, uh, who owns the building has issued uh, rules and regulations that you can access through uh, the Zoe app. Um, but they're promulgating them now before campus opens up in the fall. Um, but yes, it's illustrious of, of the issue as, as a whole. And I think, Alan, you've talked about this uh, in the past, or I've heard you speak about it, in terms of these type of issues actually uh, coming up uh, down the line uh, when some of the tenants may want to audit the landlords with respect to these kind of expenses. What do you, what, what do you think? I think we go back, I, I have to pick up on what Phil says. Look at the lease and look what's covered because the operating clause is generally written uh, very broadly in the landlord's favor, except if the tenant says only those expenses that benefit all tenants and put some caveats on and makes a distinction between operating expenses and capital expenses. Now our most recent experience has been after 9-11 because after 9-11, there were security people put in place, which I would argue would be a um, operating expense, but there were also barriers that were put into, the, um, into place, gates, and in some instances, uh, I recall 200 Park Avenue, almost like an airport type screening uh, in order to go through um, the lobby. And I would argue that's a capital expense. So we have to look at that in those contexts with what precedent that we've had before and what the lease has. Now, having said that, I doubt any lease is really anticipating what the pandemic is at this point. But that's the way these clauses are written. Um, most, most clauses, unfortunately, are boilerplate. 
So they take it and nobody really puts any thought into the fact that we could be subject to bombings in our buildings as we had in 1993 in the World Trade Center. Planes coming into our building as we did in 2001 at the World Trade Center. And I would almost venture that nobody except for people in the insurance industry anticipated a pandemic of this magnitude with its effect on leasing and operating expenses. So well, you that's really a good have to take away then, Alan, into the insurance question um, and the costs associated with that. I see you nodding your head, Phil. You want to comment? The business interruption insurers are taking the position after 9-11, for some reason, they inserted in, the, in their coverages that they excluded pandemics. You're going to find very few, if any, BI, business interruption insurance provisions, where the tenant is allowed to recover under its insurance policy. There are numerous other types of claims being made against the insurers, but it has turned out to not be a primary source of relief for either landlords or tenants. And that's a problem. We pay for insurance, we should get the coverage. Yeah. yeah. Does that apply, Wendy, to some of the larger clients that you represent uh, that have a voluminous amount of tenancies across the board in the United States and around the world? Sure. Well, first of all, a lot of the large um, retail tenants are self-insured, first of all. That's another thing. So they might not have insurance otherwise, but a lot of them are self-insured. But I just want to go back for one second to the CAM chart question that was raised and we were talking about that. We're even at the point where we're doing lease negotiations or renegotiations that we're trying to set which year will be the basis for future CAM. Because if you have a shopping mall or a building that's been closed for a certain number of months, then you would assume their expenses have been low for a period. And many landlords are now saying, we don't want to use 2020 CAM, we want to use 2019 CAM. So okay. those that don't understand what CAM charges are or why a base here makes a difference, um, why don't you jump in and tell them a little bit. So uh, the, the common area maintenance costs, um, if you have a building that's closed, people are not cleaning the halls and they're not, um, you might have laid off part of your staff as well. So those costs, the electric costs, other costs might be much lower for the building. Just like in our office now, the cost of paper is a lot lower and, and supplies. So those things are, have re, been reduced. So they are trying to determine which CAM here to use now. But that's one of the issues that are coming up as well in these lease negotiations. Um, yes. on, the, on the tenant side, you don't want to make 2020 the base year because they're artificially low and the landlord right. will be able to recoup an, an, an excessive amount. Right, so everyone is looking at it, it differently. As we said, we have different points of view depending on who the tenant is, what the property is, and who you represent. Yeah, I, 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 let's, uh, let's take out our crystal ball for a second here. Um, Phil, in the people that you've been speaking to, um, and again, it's early, but do you think this virus is going to m kind of make tenants look for more space to kind of space out things or less space um, because they can do more work from home? Um, that's one question I wanna ask. And then I have some other follow-ups related to that. If he were here, I would pass that over to my son uh, who's in that market and who is constantly dealing with technology and what's happening with the space that people are occupying. You're gonna have some companies that will reduce their space because they have found that people can actually work from home. Uh, you're gonna find other companies that want their, their employees in the building and they will need to spread them out and space them out. I can't give you a, a look into a crystal ball and give you a direct answer. That would just be uh, a guess on my part and I don't want to do that. But Alan, uh, that would lay into when you're talking to the landlord, um, the idea of whether you're going to renegotiate your lease and using that as one of the um, key points for discussion. It's interesting because um, it depends on the situation only because, and I, I'm citing to a New York Times article 
uh, I believe in May, where James Gorman, who was uh, chairman of Morgan Stanley, where I was um, for many decades a uh, real estate lawyer, said that they were looking to reduce their space. But in context with COVID, I could see that. Uh, because you know more, more people are going to be working remotely. But on the other hand, take a firm that's a financial services firm. They have trading floors where people are packed on to one another. They're efficient. They have cubicles. Um, and they might have to end up expanding in order to have social distancing and safe um, environments for workers who are coming back to work or who do have to be in the office. So they may end up in a situation of having to expand. Many law firms like Sherman, uh, when I was there, had programs to reduce space, to make them more efficient, reducing partners' offices, having more cubicles, trying to get more people in, but in tandem with existing programs that work at home for maybe their IT groups or floating groups within uh, administrative groups. So that's problematic. They might, if they do bring people back, they might need to have more space in order to satisfy the social distancing issues. So uh, without um, being uh, redundant on this, it's on a case by case basis. It's really think on, it's on the industry by industry basis. Long term, this may to... result in less yeah. space because of the ability to work at home. But there's going to be the need for overriding need for supervision, and there might be a need for additional space in order to make it healthy to come back to the office. Yeah. Wendy, I recently had the need to go to a mall. Um, when I went to the mall, no one was there, or very few people were there. And there were a number of stores that uh, were already shuttered or closed. And I don't know if they're planning to come back or they're permanently closed. But um, you were involved with a number of, uh, of malls across America that were already transitioning into uh, health clubs um, coming on board and also um, other type of uses, um, uh, other um, medical uh, facilities, et cetera. Malls were going through this transformation. Now with telecare, that might be less uh, um, appealing uh, with uh, uh, restaurants not opening up inside that that may also be an issue and then also um, with uh, health clubs uh, kind of having issues related to um, their uh, own wellness and safety for the people that attend what do you think is going to happen moving forward for some of these larger um, facilities well evidently you weren't in New Jersey because if you were in Paramus <laughs> I don't think you could get a parking spot in the Garden State Plaza in the first couple of weeks it was open. It was unbelievably tremendous, the amount of um, traffic. And I pass it on my way back and forth from my office. So I see that. So it was a bright spot and a wonderful spot. I also saw lines in front of stores because they were distancing the number of people or keeping track of the number of people that were going in. And these were not just food stores. So I think that there is a pent up demand and that demand is not always just met by home delivery or online ordering. There is a demand for people to go to a store, to see the product, to enjoy a meal with a friend or a glass of wine. And I don't think that's going to go away. So the question is, there's a balance of how to do this. Um, we actually had in our office last week, someone who signed a new restaurant lease. And I'm working on some other restaurant leases now. The person who signed the new restaurant lease was in New York. Well, why? There was a great space that was now available. And they feel confident that they will succeed in that space. Yeah. So if you're, hopefully if you're there will always be people. Yeah. That way. So there, there are great opportunities right now too, right? Um, and people, uh, are, people are trying to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think we have to realize that that will come. Um, will there be changes? Will there be differences in the experience that you've had before? Absolutely. But I think people want those experiences. That's why there's always been the 
entertainment venues coming in as part of the malls because those experiences are part of what everyone is looking for today. Yeah, and Alan, you, you lived through 9-11. Uh, you had an office uh, downtown. Um, people said uh, it would never come back and then it did in a major way. Um, you know, time, it takes time for some of these things to resolve themselves. What, what can you speak to based on your experience and, and, and dealing with that downtown? Well, it, it created a fear and paranoia, um, but downtown is downtown and it has been coming back in a very, very vi vibrant way. And I think it's a testament to, you know, the American spirit of, you know, we will, we get knocked down, but we come back. And I think, again, it's a testament to the way that we, our entrepreneurial spirit and our ability to rebound and to rebound even better than we were before. Brian, you also mentioned about um, gyms and fitness centers. And there was a recent case, Latino versus Clay LLC, that was decided in the Southern District of New York in May. And there, the, the magistrate decided that um, the performance by the fitness centers was not excused uh, and they could not rely on the issue, on the argument that they were showing financial difficulties. So even though, you know, they were looking to their force majeure clause, uh, looking at the governor's order, at least in this one case, and you know, we're not seeing you know, real consistency throughout the jurisdictions and even in New York, in this one case, financial hardship was not considered a grounds for rescinding the lease or um, um, suspending or terminating performance. Uh, thank you. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, we have some questions in the chat room. I want to remind people that are in our audience, there are approximately about 70 some odd people uh, listening to us today, and then others will uh, be able to access this uh, remotely um, through the, the tape that we're making um, at this moment. Um, if you have a question, send it into the chat room and, and I'll be happy to ask it for you. Phil, someone asked, what about linking the negotiation for modified rent payment by tenant to be the greater of a certain dollar amount or the amount the tenant actually receives for rent, utilities, taxes from the PPP money? Well, the difference there is that the PPP money doesn't give you a specific amount for rent and utilities and things like that. It gives you a percentage and it's up to the recipient of the money to decide how to do it. For example, one of my restaurant clients has told me that they paid their liquor bills rather than pay their rent because they didn't want their liquor license suspended because that had a different approach to them than would the non-payment of rent. Um, you've also got uh, other costs and expenses that recipients of PPM money would have. If you tie it to the actual income from the businesses that operate, it gives you a more reasonable measure of how much the tenant can actually afford to pay. And again, I don't recommend, I don't recommend paying nothing unless you're completely shut down. Yeah. What, what, how much of that PPP money is allocated to the rent? Is it, there's a certain percentage, 40 or, or? 40 percent is for things like rent and other expenses, for example, your health insurance. Uh, people are making, making car payments out of it. Uh, people are using it for a lot of different things other than the, the 60 percent has to go for salaries. Yeah. Um, Wendy, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I wanted to weigh in because the problem is if you're a restaurant chain and you get PPP money, which landlord do you pay part of rent to? How do you decide? Yeah. So you could have a hundred landlords. What, who, who gets what? And do you pay your franchisor first? Right. It's, it's a difficult issue. Yeah. Um, we have a number of people that are raising their hands and um, I'm not quite sure, Corey, how I get them into the uh, discussion itself, but if they were to write out their question in the chat, that, that, that might help. Um, Alan, what, what, what's your feeling on, on what we just discussed there with uh, the PPP money? 
I, well, I think you really have to go to, you know, what is considered to be in a, in a restaurant lease, a percentage of gross, and what is included in that? And does, you know, this constitute what the sales are um, and the money's coming in as government monies? Does it go where it goes to and how the tenant is going to be handling it? The concept of percentage of gross really kind of fits into what we're experiencing now. The percentage of gross concept started in the 1920s when W.T. Grant negotiated with its landlords that instead of paying straight rent, it would pay a minimum rent of X and then a percentage of its sales. And it was a similar environment as we're working through now. That is that the landlords take a risk you know, they could either become a partner with the retail tenant and make a lot of money more than what they would do for straight rent, or they lose out if the tenant really isn't making the money, which is really why the concept of percentage of gross originated. So I think we're going back into what the original concept was 100 years ago, and that the landlord takes the downside if the tenant isn't making any money but at least is guaranteed what is, you know, the minimum rent there and to see whether PP money or other monies that are coming in are const constitute the, um, you know, rent. Now, I think the biggest thing right now is, and it's, if I'm correct, the um, uh, federal government release sales and Wendy, you're probably closer to this, Wendy and Phil, I think retail sales went up about 5% last month because of online sales which if the percentage of gross lease is written in a correct way, the landlord is a beneficiary of those, of online sales that are done within the, the zip code or the immediate area of where that um, retail premises is located. So, you know, it's both ways on it. I, I'd probably be looking more at where the retail sales are originating and the online sales to make sure as a landlord, I'm getting my, my correct compensation. I think yeah, Phil Alan, wanted to uh, counter that. Alan, I didn't realize you were old enough to have worked on the WT Grant lease. <laughs> I, I look to your experience, Phil, because you're slightly yeah. older than I am. Yeah, right. Okay. You're the one who's retired, not me. I'm still working. Yeah. Did you agree with his premise, though, uh, Phil? I, I did, and uh, but except for the fact that I don't, I don't interpret PPM money as gross sales. Uh, it has nothing to do with the sale of goods, the sale of products. It's a it's a grant given by the government. Some of it some of it has to be repaid if it's not spent the right way. So uh, some of it is loan. So you can't count that as income either. Yeah, and Wendy, are are your clients constantly asking you about how to allocate that? So what what we're seeing is. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of renegotiations of leases and amendments of lease. For example, when you're talking about restaurant, restaurants, they might not have had any right to use the outdoor space. They might, we would be renegotiating for them to have outdoor space. We want them to succeed. And if they have sales and if we had percentage, if we didn't re renegotiate, would that outdoor sales be the premises in the lease of which that they would be paying percentage rent from? There is a lot of modifications that are required, to be honest with you, and each lease depends on the tenant, their history as a tenant as well. Do we think they're going to succeed? Do we want to be partners with them in, in the future? Um, we have certain tenants that have refused to pay any rent. We all know that whether they're chains or non-chains. I mean, sometimes you have to get tough with them and send out that letter and they seem to start paying. Um, we also, I'm sure all of you have seen that copy of the letter from Starbucks that they sent out in May. Starbucks sent out a letter to every one of their landlords saying, talking about the virus. And what was interesting in the letter, it says, with this in mind, effective June 1st and at least a period of 12 consecutive months, Starbucks will require concessions to support modified operations and adjustments to lease terms and base rent structures so we can withstand the uncertainty together. They also announced they were gonna close hundreds if not thousands of stores, Right. then put them in a negotiating uh, position as to which ones to keep and which ones to let go of. Um, right. You know they were moving more to the uh, drive-through model, but uh, 
it really set the table for negotiations for them moving forward, don't you think? Yeah, it did. I mean, we have some clients that got the letter and never heard another peep from them. Yeah. And other clients that, you know, have heard. So it just depends on your situation. Is it a successful st store or is it a store they want to get rid of? You know, is the location have other issues for them? That's what these land, you know, tenants are looking at as well. Yeah. Um, Alan, uh, Brendan Powell uh, just wrote in and, and wants to know, what have you found as the best way to find mutually beneficial terms for landlords and tenants? Do you think that landlords uh, uh, have an opportunity now for additional revenue generation um, through, for example, drive-in movies in their uh, parking lots? Or um, could they argue uh, that uh, there's less need um, for them and they therefore should lower their rents? So long you know, time. it's good. It's <laughs> I, I ask it's, it nonetheless. <laughs> um, it's interesting. You know, if you have a success, first of all, as Phil said, go to the lease. And even if you have the remedies that are ironclad, it's the beginning of a negotiation. Because, you know, I'll take an experience I had. We had a fire in a building where we had a brokerage office and everybody was happy on Thursday, Friday, the building burns down and landlords and tenants negotiated based on what was in the lease and what they wanted. And we had a desirable location and we wanted to stay there, but we just wanted to get back into business. So negotiations begin with the idea of, do you want to be there? And but for this pandemic, would you be continuing operating your business as it would have been before? As Wendy says, some of these some tenants might be looking as an excuse rather than a reason to shut down unprofitable operations. On the other hand, even if a tenant has a very ironclad force majeure clause, it's required to mitigate its damages. So if it's not able to operate in the premises, it still has to find ways either remotely or telecommuting to continue an operation. Now, I think also landlords, as you say, the example, can they take a parking lot and make it to a drive-in movie theater? I think this is a way that landlords are just trying to recoup, you know, some of the lost revenue rather than be creative and try to come out on, on the plus side of this because I think especially in the retail situations, which, you know, if Wendy and Phil can agree to this, retail was already having a problem before. And now the pandemic is making it even worse and throwing a lot of good reputable organizations into bankruptcy. Are the landlords gonna be able to find replacement tenants to the extent that they're losing tenants and losing revenues in these places? So I don't think it's a, you know, uh, in any way a bonanza for landlords to find better ways of making money. I think what they're trying to do is scratch their way into getting revenues in order to meet their own obligations as this pandemic goes through and they're being hit with uh, loss of uh, revenues. Yeah, uh, Phil, we'll go to you in a second, but uh, Wendy, what, does the restaurant have an obligation to mitigate, as, as Alan said, by offering takeout or, or um, you know, to, to adjust their business for the pandemic? Um, well, the, the biggest problem you have with restaurants, frankly, is they all have a very small profit margin. Unless you're in certain locations in the United States, the profit margin on restaurants is three to 5% typically. Their expenses are already very high and rent is one of the highest por portion of their rates. You know, revenue, uh, the expenses, so what are they doing? They're modifying their menus. So the menus are smaller. They're coming up with takeout, but really they make their money on volume. If their, their mar profit margin is so small, they have to make their profit on, on volume. And that volume would include not just takeout, but in, in person, in facility dining, it might do catering. But if you're gonna, stop the number of people they could have if they could only have a quarter of the people in their restaurant and there's not enough room outside for everyone 
it's going to affect their profit margin. So how are they going to pay the rent? Yeah. I mean, there are uh, many, that's the problem. Yeah. Philip, going back to that question about um, that, that the audience member raised about what they should be talking about and following up on Alan, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I defer to Phil. Yeah, that's why I went to Phil. <laughs> I love the pearls. Listen, uh, as bad a, an event as 9-11 was, within a period of time, we started to build up a feeling that it was over and that it wasn't going to repeat itself. We don't know when this is going to end. And as many people have written, the fear of the unknown is the greatest fear. We're trying to make things happen based upon a reasonable res restoration of some uh, types of normalcy, new normalcy, as they call it. There's, for example, one very fine restaurant here in Essex County, New Jersey, which won't open because they can't, they can't cover expenses uh, by only having 20 seats available outside and doing takeout. Uh, you're going to find people have to communicate with one another. That's the only answer. Landlords are suffering, tenants are suffering. How do we allocate? Normally when you negotiate a lease, you're allocating the risk. We're past that. We know what the risk is. We're gonna be shut down. How are we going to allocate the pain that we're all suffering now to try and make do and get through? Yeah, all good negotiation, I think, resolves around excellent communication. And it's something that I stress in the classroom all the time. We have one last question, and then I'm going to give you all uh, the ability to sum up. Um, but it's been an excellent uh, discussion. Uh, Sabiashi Das asks, with disruptions in essential sectors, is there evidence of large-scale triple net lease negotiations in sectors such as airlines and hotel industries. I'm not quite sure that any of you have experts in expertise in that area, but I do know that uh, hotels and airlines are hurting right now, uh, but particularly hotels in New York City. Uh, and there's going to be a tremendous amount of change in, 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 in that sector, uh, the hospitality sector moving forward. Do you have anything to add there, Phil? I just did a lease for uh a client in Middlesex County, New Jersey in a catering facility with a restaurant. And the, it wasn't a triple net lease, it was a gross lease. We allocated the risk so that the landlord would have to deal with the issues of operating expenses, taxes and the like. I'm not so sure as to whether or not the gross lease is gonna have a resurgence. Yeah, and operating uh, triple net leases uh, are really concentrating uh, on the tax situation more than anything else, right? And uh, we don't know where that's even going to be headed um, moving forward, Wendy, correct? We don't know. And, and for hotels, many of them have chosen during the pandemic to close down temporarily because they're, way, they're looking in the way to keep their operating expenses low. Uh, you know, the owner or the operator wants to has furloughed their employees and it's cut down. They can't keep ordering food and other expenses. And to just have a few, few guests in the hotels is not enough to cover. So they're yeah. found it's more economical to close down. But I do years. think we're going to see a big shake out there. Um, there's been some talk of uh, um, converting them over for uh, other uses, um, and, and the city itself uh, looking at the at the, the real drastic need for affordable housing if some of those um, facilities can be used for that. With one minute to go, let's start with Alan summing up and, and, and then we'll do a complete uh, Robin round here. Okay, Alan? Yeah, I think we said all that we could within the hour uh, on a very, very thorough analysis of the theories and you know this, the, the fact that it's a work in progress and covering all the specific areas that we could. Just one point on the insurance applications. Um, I would say that the insurers are going to be more than reluctant to either allow claims under BI insurance or contingency insurance uh, in the wake of not only 9-11, but the SARS outbreak in 2020, uh, 22 and 23, the insurers excluded viral bacterial outbreaks. So we not only had the conversion from all risk to causes of loss, but we had a lot of exclusions. Just want to cite 
several sources that uh, students you know, or our listeners can go to. There's a very good uh, American College of Real Estate Lawyers webinar called The Impact of Coronavirus Pandemic on the Performance of Real Estate Contracts that uh, was held on July 9th. George Bernhard, Jack Fersco, Shelby Green, um, that offered a lot of great material, as well as uh, an article by Dan Orvin called Eviction Moratoriums Under the CARES Act from April of, of April 20th of 2020. And just to put a little plug for my own book, uh, Negotiating Drafting Commercial Leases, which we've used as a textbook in uh, our commercial leasing undergrad and graduate courses. And we're going to be addressing the COVID in our next up. Um, release, but a lot of material coming out, a lot of very good material from ABA, ACRO, uh, professional organizations, and follow the news, the, the Times, the journals, the real estate observers are covering this um, on almost a daily basis. Uh, Phil, how would you like to sum up? Well, I think that since Alan is retired, he has a lot more time to do a lot of reading. So I use him as my source for things that I should read. So I appreciate that. One thing that I didn't get to touch upon uh, when, after you finished the CARES Act with regard to commercial property uh, dispossess actions and lawsuits for possession. In Essex County, New Jersey, the statistic I was given is that they're already backed up 5,000 cases. I heard, I don't know, Wendy, if you have anything more current, but I heard that Bergen County was about 3,000. That means if you file a case today in Essex County, you'll be number 5,001. Chances of you being heard in October, November, December are getting slimmer and slimmer. So while you may, while landlords may bluster and, and beat their chests and tell you everything they're going to do to you, don't get frightened. Don't be intimidated. Uh, Wendy, how would you sum up? Uh, I would say that I would say there's not one size that fits all. So in every transaction, every lease, every situation, you have to do what Phil said, look at the lease, read the lease, understand what the concerns of the landlord, the tenant, maybe the lender are, and then come to a mutual agreement with the tenant, the landlord, and the lender. And I, I bring the lender in because in many instances, the landlord has no right to amend the lease without mm -hmm. the lender. And hopefully it's not a lender that's a CMBS, we need to go to servicers, et cetera. So um, it's, it's a, a problem. And that's what everyone has to work together to get to the mutual agreeable, work something out for everyone. Well, I wanna thank all three of you, our panelists today, uh, Philip Neuer, Alan DeShula, Wendy Berger, uh, three prime examples of the very best um, professors that the Shack Institute of Real Estate has to offer. This has been uh, my uh, distinct honor uh, to kind of moderate the discussion on how to handle at least negotiations in the age of uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, we are at Shack are going to have ongoing faculty talks, um, not just throughout the rest of the summer, but also uh, into the fall semester. We're prepared for a very robust and um, uh, interesting and engaging fall semester with our students, uh, with our alumni, and uh, we look forward to you checking out our social media on Instagram, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn uh, for future discussions uh, like the one that we have today. So thank you all very much for joining me today, and be well, uh, be safe, and uh, we'll see you soon.